Hello, I'm Markus Raupach from Germany. I have the German Beer Academy and I'm ambassador for the German Brewers Association. Right, uh, what's the state of the craft industry in Germany right now? It depends a lot on what you define as craft in Germany because um, we have never had that huge craft beer movement like you had in the US for example but we have a lot of traditional crafts still there and being like infected by the craft beer movement and so that changed a lot so if we go on these breweries who are more or less looking like the American craft breweries there has been a huge losses in the last year so maybe it's one third or even less of them still surviving and some of them even changing to traditional beer styles. So they now also make like a Helles, like a, like lager beers, like traditional styles, not only IPAs. So there's a, a shift, let's say like this. But on the other hand, um, the whole idea of craft, that really went into the industry and also into the consumers. And that's a consistent thing. So for example, also the traditional breweries, like let's say, let's just normal Franconian breweries who did lagers for 500 years. No, they also have an IPA, they have like a wit beer, like a triples or whatever. So they do beer styles from all over the world with ingredients from all over the world. So that's a, a huge new movement. And also the consumer, they don't buy, let's say, three crates of 20 bottles, half a liter Helles. Now they buy maybe six or eight bottles and mix them between different breweries and styles, and they are willing to pay more for these beers. So in general, it's in a, in a good way. It really changed our beer market, and also it created new possibilities, new options for breweries, also for the traditional breweries to have new markets, new ideas, and new developments. So it's not only the... the uh I would say the myth, the uh, the perception that the, the German uh, beer drinker is going for the cheapest beer they can, uh, at uh, you know, and drink as much as they can of cheap. That's, we won't say crap beer, but beer that's maybe not up to the quality standards that we tend to like. I think first we have to, to round something up. Uh, in Germany, it was never the case mm -hmm. that the industrial beer is bad quality beer because we have the purity law and we have a very, very high standard of quality. So even if you have the cheapest German bottle of beer, it will be a high quality product. The only thing is it's made for a mass market. So it will be more or less easy drinking, but not very identifiable or a lot of, of, of differentiation to other beers of the same style. So if you have 10 industrial Helles, 10 industrial Pilsners, they will more or less be the same. Very good, but just normal. And that is something that now has changed. So now we have a, a variety of beers that are different. And so I wouldn't say it's quality, it's just more diversity and also the influence, for example, by American brewers, by British brewers, by Belgian brewers, but even by Australian brewers, Italian brewers, is big on the human market and the other way around, or on, on the German market, sorry, and the other way around. So, um, as we said, we have more different beers, we have more, let's say, interesting beers, more diverse beers, and so people have a greater choice, and so they stop only by the cheapest ones. So, of course, if you have a barbecue and you just want to have something easy drinking for the people, maybe you buy a cheaper crate of Helles, but people also like to buy more from smaller breweries, from local breweries, so the big ones are losing market share, so also on this. And on the other hand, if I have my 50th birthday, for example, then I will buy something special for my guests. So the German beer market and the consumer is healthy and innovative. It is. It is more invent innovative than it was ever before. So that's really a great message. Um, it's healthy, although, of course, people are drinking less, especially in terms of alcohol. But that means you have to be creative as a brewery. So we have more non-alcoholic or less alcoholic beers. Very interesting. For example, my hometown, Bamberg, we have the Schlenkeler Brewery, which is well known for a smoked beer. And it was the first German brewery to invent a low alcohol beer on the speciality level. So they now have even a smoky beer with about 1% of alcohol, and which, was a, which is a huge success on the market and there are more follow-ups like this so the market is creative and now at the moment we are very yeah we're, we're curious how it works because all the world is like going back to lager so if you go now to the states for example they all try to make like hellas like pilsners like all lager styles and of course that is something we are really good in <laughs> so that's uh, very interesting to see and so of course the german market is it's uh, it's changed but it's still healthy 
And the outsiders uh, see the German market as a lucrative market to try and enter, foreigners. We know what happened to Stone Brewing when he tried to enter Berlin and then hmm. had to give up. And But then BrewDog took over those. Uh, do you see a lot of the uh, foreign investment in the German market, or is it sort of died out the interest? They can't conquer it. Uh, it's, a, it's also a bit of a question. So in general, I would say it's not because of they cannot conquer it. It's just because of it's not interesting in terms of earning a lot of money. Because when I, I was just in Nashville for the World Beer Cup, and I visited lots of breweries, and in every brewery of every size, I got the same answer, we want to grow. And if you go, for example, to 50 traditional Franconian breweries, the least thing they will say is we want to grow. They say we are like we are for 500 years and we don't want to grow, we just want to be as we are. And that is a very different idea of this business. And so if you come with the idea of huge growth, whatever, you will have hard times in Germany. So that's why we had some of them, for example, Urban Chestnut as a brewery. Uh, also, they were the first, maybe for Stone, for example, and they are still existing and that works, for example. So that, that's OK. And we also have like Belgium or French or other people in the country. For me, Stone was a very special thing mm -hmm. because um, it was their marketing that they said it was German market who didn't want us. Yeah. <laughs> I think on the other the hand, they, God, yes, they, really they had, they had, they, they made them, <laughs> of course, it's hard if you go into the German market and the first thing you do is destroy crates of German beer and say, we, we teach you a new way of yeah, drinking that arrogant. will <laughs> never work ever. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you, that was when he, when I was there and, 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 and I know them very well. Um, and, um, and, but when they opened the brewery, he looked very different. He was not beer Jesus. He had a, a Bavarian clothing. He had a leather shirt, and they had a traditional wooden barrel, stone beers, but a wooden barrel, and he tapped it. So it was very traditional, and there was no way of throwing stones in German beers. It was, we are now in this market. We adapt that market, and we are part of that. And what there was the original idea to have something in Europe as a showroom for the power of American craft beer, that's, that worked very well. And for me, it was clear from the first moment that that will never be a profit center. But that was not the idea. The idea was to have something in Europe where everyone could fly in from the whole continent to see the power of stone brewing, to see what is possible, and also to have a production center in the European Union from where you could dis um, distribute through the whole continent. And I think there they made some mistakes and they had problems in the States. As you know, they had to kick off people, lay off people, and they had the process with, with Keystone and all these things. And so it turned out in the end that it's a win-win situation if you have the BrewDog people who had the problem of Brexit. Yes. <laughs> so 90% of what they do is punk IPA, and 90% of that they sell in the U European Union. So at the moment, they were just about to leave the European Union, and they had the problem how to survive if we cannot bring our product in our market again. So for them, it was perfect to have a huge um, production center with a modern canning line with all what was necessary to produce that in the heart of Europe. So, and that is a no-brainer for the BrewDog people and also on the other hand for Stone because they could get rid of that very cost-intensive thing <laughs> in Berlin, that adventure. But it was not something to blame the German people. It was just a yeah, bad, uh, <laughs> bad. Uh, well, it was his yeah. personality as yeah. well. He got into yes. a lot of trouble in the U.S. over things he was saying. And and I can understand that the American people, especially the workers at the brewery, said, uh, "Why do you throw that money away in Germany when we have problems at home?" So, I really can understand that. The only thing I I. I really, I'm a bit sad of it is that he doesn't, didn't communicate that, that he made this story of the bad German people, which is really not true. Yeah, yeah. And red tape. And yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much for giving us a perspective on the German beer market and talking to the beer idiots. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>